We've been going through several stages. We talked about self-awareness. Who am I? Asking that central question in one's life. Looking at your strengths and your weaknesses. Getting some evaluation, determining what it is you want out of life. Then we went to the next level of self what? Self-approval. Approving yourself to do the things that you like to do. And going after the dreams that you like to go after. And we know when we don't approve of our dreams because of the fact that they stay up in our minds. We don't act on them. We procrastinate. We come up with a variety of excuses on why we're not going into action. And then the next level is what? Self-commitment. Going for that dream. Going for those goals. Deciding to do the things that are necessary to bring about the changes that we want to bring in our lives or what we want to bring in society. And then after that, we are now to this level. And this stage is what? Self-fulfillment. Because when you are involved in commitment, when you are implementing your plan of action, you're going to produce some results. You're going to have some victories that you can feel good about. And it's a time of celebration. So what happens when you hit the level of self-fulfillment? First of all, what we want to know is that self-fulfillment is unending and should be viewed in that context. Robert Shula says it best when he says, success is never ending. So that means that we never get to a level where we feel that there's nothing else for us to do, that we've achieved certain number of goals and we figure that we're through. No, no. You don't want to stay there and celebrate too long like a lot of people do. When they do something they consider outstanding, they go around talking about what they used to do. See, let me tell you, I used to do this and I used to do that. Excuse me, used to bees don't make no honey. <laughs> what are you doing now? What have you done for me lately? You know? <laughs> Go around telling people about what you used to do and who you used to be. <laughs> what does that count for now? Nothing. What are you doing now? You're still here breathing. That means you've got some more to give. Doesn't matter how old you are, doesn't matter about where you are, doesn't matter about what you have, doesn't matter about what you've done. Life is about growing, it's about being productive, it's about stretching, it's about challenging yourself. So you start looking around and decide, hey, hey, wh what else do I want to do? What, what got me here? It's a time for celebration, but also a time for reflection. What got me here? What worked? What did not work? What do I need to do to repeat so that I can get the same kind of results in other areas of my life? If the goal is to improve my health, if the goal is to improve my relationship, if the goal is to improve my income, if the goal is to improve something in society, what is it I need to do? Now don't get confused with what you do with who you are. Don't trip. Don't go on some type of ego trip by talking about how bad you are. None of us do anything by ourselves. Develop an appreciation for external support as well as good fortune because all of those things play a role. The other thing is, don't go overboard celebrating. Kipling says it best, you must meet with triumph and disaster and treat those two imposters just the same. You look at it, hey, I did it, I feel good about that. Now you're moving on to the next thing. Things did not work out the way you wanted them to work out. You didn't produce the results you wanted to produce. Hey, miss that. Win some, you lose some. Next, moving right on. Don't confuse who you are with what you do. Let's go on to the next level looking in that particular area. You return to the area of self-assessment, you start looking at yourself and evaluating yourself. Now, what are some of the elements or the characteristics or the qualities of people who are fulfilled, who, who live a life of fulfillment? What are some of the things we can look at about them? I think, number one, make your mind fertile ground for the seeds of opportunity. Think if you want to experience a sense of fulfillment, you've got to have an open mind so that ideas can come in there and take root and grow. So part of beginning to have fertile ground, you know, you got to break that ground up. You got to break up that hard crust because if you don't, seeds will fall there and the wind can blow them away, the winds of doubt. When you're set in your mind and you refuse to grow and you're not open to new ideas, new methods, new ways of doing things. If your mind is already fixed, you become stagnant. You can't grow, you can't have a sense of fulfillment. You become extremely cynical and negative about everything. You know it all. 
So you want to begin to look at life and have a sense of curiosity, not know it all. You want to keep learning, keep growing. Realize that we had a theme. You never find out how much you know until you find out how little you know. And there are some people you can't tell anything. They have all the answers. Oh, I've already done that. Larry D'Angelo was telling me, he said he was on a plane and he was observing two men talking and he, the guy was um, reading a magazine. He looked at the guy next to him and said, would you like to um, read this magazine, I'm, share this magazine I have? No, I read that before. Don't like it. Don't like it. Okay. So he had a newspaper. He said, um, what about the USA Today? No, I read that before. Don't like that either. Try that once. Don't like that. So they served them some food. And he said, would you care to have anything I have here because the guy wasn't eating? No, no, tried that before, I don't like that. And um, he noticed guy only had one child. He said, <laughs> what Larry was trying to say is <laughs> that a lot of people go through life prejudging things. How many of you don't like buttermilk? Raise your hands, please. How many of you raise your hands and never taste Butterbill, please? Uh, <laughs> and I'm one of them. I just don't like the way it looks, all right? I might be missing out on something, all right? So many of us count ourselves out of things prematurely. You don't know what the possibilities are up in there. So you want to be open. You want to continue to learn. You want to continue to grow. You want to begin to know that there are unlimited ideas out here waiting for you to latch on to them. And if you don't take advantage of them when they come your way because you're so close-minded, do understand somebody else will. And we've all had ideas that we did not act on and looked around and somebody else had the idea and gone with it. So be open and receptive. Next thing, if, in order to live a fulfilling life, become involved in life. Live your fantasy. Most people go through life not living their fantasy, going, sitting up in the bleachers, looking out on the field, looking out into the arena, wishing that they were down there, just fantasizing, seeing themselves running with the ball. I used to do that. I used to always see myself at a basketball game. One second to go, Les Brown comes down court. He looks to his right, looks to his left. He's the only one that can do it. Dush, the basket goes in, Les saved us, and people picked me up and carried me off. But I never went out and did it. <laughs> Decide to live your fantasy. See, in life, you can go through life, you can come up with reasons or you can come up with results. You can come up with excuses or you can come up with achievements. You can go through life blaming or you can come up with solutions. The choice is in your hands, satisfaction or despair. We can choose that. So look at your life and decide what it is that you want to do that will give your life a sense of worth. Someone said that your life worth is measured by your accomplishments and not by your complaints. If you want to have a fulfilling life, decide not to make your life predictable. So some people, their lives are very predictable. They got a little routine, they do that, and they follow that day in and day out. Day in and day out. You don't get much juice and happiness out of life like that if you are predictable. You want to change it up. Variety most certainly is the spice of life. Here's something else. Want to create a greater sense of fulfillment? Challenge your fears. Challenge them. Look those fears in the face and take them on. Don't allow them to rule you. Decide that you're going to take some chances. A friend of mine by the name of Adrian, he said one day he decided to have a day of challenge. So he and a friend went to Cedar Point. <laughs> So he's always been afraid of certain rides. So he said on this particular day, he said he decided that he was going to go on the most dangerous rides at Cedar Point. So they went around looking at all the rides. And so the young lady that he was with and said, that's the one there. That's it. She, he said, why that one? He said, well, she said, um, I, I read about it in the newspaper. Said two people were killed last year on that. <laughs> he said, yes, that's the one I want. That's the one, you know. So he got in the line and said it was a long line. Had to wait in line for about two hours. And they just said, while he was in line, and as they started getting closer, he said he started doubting them. Said, well, maybe I should not do this. Maybe. So she says, no, come on, get back in line. He said, no, 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 no. I changed my mind. I don't want to do this. I don't have to have the most dangerous ride. 
He said he started visualizing himself being thrown out of this big ride and his name on the front page of the newspaper after being splattered against a wall or something. So he just started saying, no, I don't want to do it. But his friend insisted, no, come on, Adrian, we said we were going to do it. We we're going to confront our fears today. Come on, just stay in line. So he kept on, he said he was arguing with her the whole time. They got up there and the guy said, okay, next. He said, no, no, I just decided to change my mind. She said, come on. She pushed him. They went there and he got in the, in the little seat and they strapped him in. And as they began to move, he said, wait a minute, I want to get out. But it was too late. <laughs> so they started taking him up. He says, oh, no, please, please. I got a bad heart. Let me out. And he was up there and he was gone. He said he screamed all through that ride. <laughs> His friend was laughing, her wig came off. <laughs> Before they finished, he'd lost his partial. <laughs> when he got off, he was gumming it. You know? <laughs> but Adrian said, less when I got off, he said, I walked a little taller. <laughs> And he said he felt good inside. And one of the things he said, he said, hey, it wasn't that bad after all. <laughs> and we've all had experiences, things that we dread doing. And when we finally did it, we said, hey, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Raise your hand if you ever had that experience before. Hey, 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 I just thought I'd die if I did this. I didn't die. I'm still here. And ladies and gentlemen, that's, that's what most people miss out of life. You've got to be willing to risk. If you're not willing to risk, you can't grow in life. Life has no power when you're not willing to risk. Somebody wrote this and it was given to me. It said, to laugh is to risk appearing the fool. To weep is to risk appearing sentimental. To reach out for another is to risk involvement. To expose feelings is to risk exposing your true self. To place your ideas, your dreams before a crowd is to risk their loss. To love is to risk not being loved in return. To live is to risk dying. To hope is to risk despair. To try is to risk failure. But risk must be taken because the greatest hazard in life is to risk nothing. The person who risks nothing, does nothing, has nothing, is nothing. They may avoid suffering and sorrow, but they cannot learn, feel, change, grow, love, and live. Chained by their certitudes, they are a slave. They have forfeited their freedom. Only a person who risks is free. I'm reminded of a missionary who had gone to Africa to work with a certain tribe. They were called the headhunters. And there was a reporter observing him and for a long period of time he had a, a limited relationship with him they would not take him in and he said because he was tentative and hesitant and fearful he didn't want to risk having a relationship with him because he didn't want to mess around and have his head taken off <laughs> he had this fear and obviously it showed and the tribesmen sensed it say so one night he was sleeping and he made a decision because the reporter came back and saw him and he had an incredible relationship with the tribesmen, these headhunters. The guy said, what happened? How did you convert the distance, the hostility, into a warm, close relationship? He said, I had a dream one night. He said, I was thinking and, and he said, I dreamed. He said, what, you know, what's my passion? What's my life goal? He said, I always wanted to be a missionary. And he said, this is the work I love. And he said, in the dream, he asked himself, how much do you love it? I said, I'm willing to die for this dream. And he said, and he thought about that when he woke up, that he loved doing this so much that if it was in fact his passion, that it was his, in fact his life's work, he's willing to die for it. And so therefore he said, he had no longer any fear of death. And he went in there and started working with them. And obviously they picked that up. And he said something else that was profound. He said, when you no longer fear dying, what else can life threaten you with? What else? See, when, when you are willing to risk all of it, when you're making that kind of commitment, somebody always defined commitment, I love it. So the next time you have bacon and eggs, look at it, say the chicken was involved, but the pig was committed.
<laughs> he had to give it all up. <laughs> See, when you're willing to give it all up, <laughs> See, that's, that's what life is. See, you've got to be willing to give it all up. When you're willing to, to throw it all on the line, that's when life takes on a whole new dimension. See, most people won't do that. They won't risk that. So decide to take some risks. You want to break the routine. Most people go through life following that routine, and we know that that is a living death. Going through life, playing it safe, is, is, is like a breathing corpse. Because the only way that you can grow, you've got to risk. The only way that you can become your best, you have got to risk. You've got to challenge yourself. You've got to venture into the unknown. You've got to take some chances. Got to put you on the line. So in order to have that sense of fulfillment, getting out of your comfort zone, as you get out of your comfort zone, you expand your whole life. The more you do, the more you realize you can do. You expand your capacity. You expand your potential. You expand your horizons. You expand your vision of yourself and of life. You expand your participation in life. You're involved in life more. You'll get more out of life because you're putting more into life than most people. That's why it's so important that we are willing to take some risks. I don't know exactly what to do. It's okay. You'll find out. You either learn that you're going in the right direction or the wrong direction. And from that you learn. You'll get some feedback. The universe will tell you, where do I get started? Just get started. The universe will give you immediate feedback. Don't worry. You hit your head long enough, you'll get the message. <laughs> Lose enough money, you'll learn real quick. Get enough knots on your head, it'll be all right. Here's something else. Choose to be happy in spite of life's challenges. In spite of life's challenges. Life changes every day. Sometimes things will be going your way. Sometimes things work well for you. Sometimes it won't work so well. Sometimes you have your health, you're feeling good and energetic, have a yes I can attitude and, and there's some things that can happen to you in life that can take all of that from you. All of that can go. Sometimes you might be financially secure and a sickness, one sickness can wipe out an illness. Life always change. But you can choose, you can choose in the midst of all of this that's going on to be happy in spite of it. In the good times and in the bad times, you can make a choice. Viktor Frankl, he, he talks about that. He said, the last of the human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. Douglas Matlock has a poem I love entitled, It's Fine Today. He said, sure, this world is full of trouble. I ain't said it ain't. Lord, I've had enough and double reason for complaint. Rain and storm have come to fret me. Skies are often gray. Thorns and brambles have beset me on the road. But say, ain't it fine today? What's the use of always weeping, making trouble last? What's the use of always keeping, thinking of the past? Each must have his tribulation, water with his wine. Life, it ain't no celebration. Trouble, I've had mine, but today is fine. It's today that I'm living, not a month ago, having, losing, taking, giving, as time wills it so. Yesterday, a cloud of sorrow fell across the way. It may rain again tomorrow. It may rain, but say, ain't it fine today? <laughs> Isn't that good? I like that. So even if a cloud of sorrow comes over here, Ain't it fine today, living in the moment, getting everything we can out of where we are in the moment where we are right now, living in the present. The other thing is willingness to let people and things go. You want to live a life of fulfillment. You've got to be willing to let certain people go in your life, especially if they want to go. Don't 
Get addicted to material things. Be willing to let things or people go. When they're no longer good for you, just let them go. Just to hold on tenaciously really doesn't make really good sense, all right? Just many times we do it because we don't realize that we might desire it, but we don't need it. Next thing is face the truth about life and deal with it. And a lot of people, when someone in their life that they love very much dies, they allow it to take such a toll on them, they make themselves miserable, and they literally will themselves to die early because they feel without this person they have nothing to look forward to. And no, no, life has other opportunities, other relationships, other experiences for us. And the people that we love really want us to go on. Other thing is, things are going to happen to you. Here, in order to have a fulfilling life, knowing that, that things are going to happen, expect the unexpected. Whatever happens to you, use everything for your upliftment, learning, and growth. Everything that happens, use it for your upliftment, learning, and growth. In the midst of it, ask, what can I learn from this? What can I get from this? How did I end up here? What's the blessing in this for me? Ask yourself that whatever it is, and don't let it go until you get your blessing out of it because there's a blessing there. There's a lesson there. There's something for you in everything that happens to you for you to learn from that experience. Look at it, examine it, analyze it, dissect it, take it apart until it reveals itself to you. And then get what you need from that and move on. But everything that happens to you, have a friend she stutters and I said are you taking any special classes to stop from stuttering she said N -n -n no I said why because it helps my business I said how when I go in to somebody I say now if, if you're busy I I I'll come back because I, I, I stutter and they used to say oh no 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 you can tell me right now and then she say, well, this is, this is my product. And she said, after she goes through it, and if they say no, she said, well, you didn't understand. <laughs> Let me t t t t t tell you again. <laughs> and she they say, oh, no, no, that's all right. How much you said it is? <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Don't tell, don't tell me no more. That's all right. Just let me know how much I need to give you so you can get, 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 get on out of here. <laughs> so she's turned that stuttering to her advantage. Somebody says, if your life give you lemon, write yourself a lemon cookbook. You know? <laughs> so everything. So I have people say to me, hey, uh, I really feel sorry, you know, for you. The fact, it's a shame they labeled you educable, mentally retarded. I said, it's okay. I've told this story before. AT&T, Procter & Gamble, McDonald's Corporation, Xerox, they pay a whole lot of money to head, too. <laughs> what would I have to say if they hadn't done that, you know? <laughs> Whatever happens to you, turn it to your advantage. So I have now made that a blessing for me as opposed to a handicap. I went and proved them wrong by engaging in self-study and consciously working to develop myself. So now they have to ask themselves, what, what were we thinking about when we labeled this guy? What was going on? And then there are people who look at me and say, wait a minute, this guy, he, he was labeled it, what? Retarded, you gotta be kidding. If he's done what he's done, what can I do with what I've got? That's what happens, so when I get through talking and, and motivating a sales force, they leave there ashamed not to be motivated. Say, that retarded guy can do it. I know, I got to do something. <laughs> they ready to run out the room, you know? <laughs> I got to do something up in here. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Am I making any sense to you? Huh? Here's something I encourage you to do. Whatever you do, do it in a consciousness of love. See, if 
if you if you love what you do and if you decide to love people to make wherever you are an experience of love just decide to be a loving person regardless if the people you around are loving or not just see I've never read anywhere where they say God has love I've never read that what is what but how does it go what, what is it? God is love not that God has love now if we are the children of God we are the offsprings of God then we are what love see love is not an emotion love is not something you can give you you can't give love you must be love you've got to be a loving person so as you operate in that consciousness and this comes not just overnight with enlightenment or insight or just someone recommending that but with practice practice and practice and practice and doing it and doing it and doing it and working consciously how, how do you do that how with, with all of the evil things and evil people how, how do you do that well, one of the things is we've got to practice to be non-judgmental to suspend judgment that if you can in the midst of where you are know a gentleman by the name of Jeffrey in Chicago when I go there to do my training he's a quadriplegic he used to be a bitter young man he's involved in a car accident and is paralyzed cannot move his neck he, quadriplegic complete he used to be very bitter very angry he decided to become a loving person as a result of Jeffrey's decision Jeffrey's life has taken a dramatic turn he is now an inspiration and a blessing to other people there are people who say wait a minute and I know one guy in particular who's always a cynical negative guy and I introduced him to Jeffrey he said if this guy could be pleasant and loving and have a smile on his face how can I worry about this little stuff I'm worried about how can I allow life to get next to me how can I talk about being depressed when I can get up and move around and walk around and Jeffrey can't do that and he's confined to this wheelchair Jeffrey has decided in, in a spirit of love to make his life a blessing to other people he's going back to school he writes with a pencil in his mouth he is determined sometimes he becomes a little frustrated sometimes he does get a little depressed but he doesn't allow it to keep him there he's a loving spirit you can feel it in his consciousness just being around him you can look at him and feel good inside he's an inspiration to the people that come in contact with his life that's a decision that he has made and I feel that we can all make that decision and how to get unstuck I think some of you know what I mean <laughs> sometimes we have to ask ourselves what's using my life heard a guy give a lecture one time that says we are today what we were when and he was talking about the fact that we, to a great extent, behave, think, react because of some previous experience that we've had. One of the things that we know about life is that it is always changing. Sometimes you're up, sometimes you're down. Sometimes things go real well, and sometimes they don't. Sometimes you're happy, and sometimes you're sad. Now that's that thing called life. And when we begin to understand and know that, accepting that reality that, that we will never ever have things just on an even kill all the time, that you're gonna have some ups and you're gonna have some downs. But during those down moments, that's where the growth takes place. That's where the work is. See, anybody can feel good when they have their health, their bills are paid, they have happy relationships, the children are acting normal, <laughs> business is successful. Anybody could be positive then. Anybody can have a larger vision then. Anybody can have faith under those kinds of circumstances. Am I correct? Yeah. See, but the real challenge, 
The real challenge of growth, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, comes when you get knocked down. Somebody said that, that adversity introduces a man to himself or a woman. How you handle it, that's where the growth takes place. When I was facing some challenges, I had a guy say something to me and I suggest this is one of the first things that you want to do when you're facing a challenge. You want to get unstuck. Evaluate where you are. Look at it. Assess yourself. Assess yourself and assess the situation. What brought you there? What role did you play? Earl Nightingale had a saying I like. He said, all of us are self-made, but only the successful will admit it. <laughs> <laughs> What has brought you to this point? What did you learn from it? Are you learning anything? Or are you doing it over and over and over again? Somebody said that insanity is doing the same thing in the same way, expecting a different outcome. <laughs> are you going through it or are you growing through it? Are you bigger and better because of it? Because it's not going to leave you until you grow through it. I was going through a major challenge in my life that was wearing me out, that was using me. And one of my students told me in a class that I was teaching, Lessons in Truth, she said, Les, until you handle it with grace, it will stay in your face. Mm. And it stayed there a long time. <laughs> The challenges of life, how do, we get it, how do we get stuck? A friend of mine went through a divorce, my best friend. He had a wife that did not love him as much as he loved her. It was his first real true love. He was a very religious man, did not believe in divorce. He made a mistake and he paid for his mistake with a lot of pain a lot of tears and there came to a point where he knew he should have gotten a divorce but he was stuck he was stuck in something called revenge he said she's made me so miserable i'm going to pay her back <laughs> he was stuck and he stayed in there longer than he should have because it began to uh, attack him it began to affect him psychologically And as a result of that, when he eventually did get a divorce, he took that same attitude to other relationships, looking for something to go wrong. He was burned so badly, he did not want to risk pain again. He was going in relationships trying to avoid pain. When it became too close, he would do something to make sure the relationship did not work. He would always try and find something wrong with the person because they're no perfect people. So if you look for it, you can find it. He was stuck in revenge. Another friend of mine, working on a job, loved the company very much, expected to retire there. And one day they call him in the office, ask him for his badge and identification, told the security man up, walked into his desk, told him he was fired and he had to leave then. He was devastated. And if you came anywhere near him, he will tell you his story, as we all have stories. <laughs> Even when he got a job, he went on the job telling anybody who would listen how they fired him unjustly. And he always ended with, it wasn't fair. Life isn't fair. Life just is. It's not fair that birds eat worms. And they do. <laughs> so we, can, we can't even deal with what's fair. But he's stuck in the fact that it's not fair. I don't deserve that. They were wrong. I used to be a state legislator in Columbus, Ohio. During the break, we used to go out on the front lawn of the Ohio legislature at the Capitol there and observe people as they came by. There was one particular person that all of us knew. The children, adults, everybody used to pick at him when he came by. We called him Chicken Man. He had a feather in his hat. He had a toy chicken on top of his car that he would drive around the area in downtown blinking his lights and occasionally blowing his horn. When he got out of his car, he would, drive, he would walk downtown with a baby carriage with two little baby dolls in there and a picture of a woman. 
And when you say something to him or came near him, you would hear him making the sounds of a chicken. All of us used to laugh at Chicken Man. We didn't know Chicken Man's story. Chicken Man woke up one morning around 3 a.m. and his house was on fire. He panicked and he got out of the window and left quickly, only to get outside to hear his children and his wife screaming for help. He ran back to the door to go in to save them and the flames were too hot, too awesome. He tried to get in, he couldn't get in. He was desperate, frantic. Pretty soon the cries stopped, they perished in the fire. His brother-in-law came, found out that his sister had died and his niece is in the fire, grabbed Chicken Man and started beating him. You chicken, why didn't you save my sister? You're a chicken, you're a chicken. When the people pulled him off Chicken Man, they picked him up and said, are you all right? And Chicken Man looked at him and he started making the sounds of a chicken. He never ever overcame that tragedy. He was stuck from that experience. None of us knew why Chicken Man went around with this picture and these little dolls. I remember when I was stuck in anger for a long time, when I made a commitment to my adopted mother that I was gonna purchase her a home. I'll never forget the experience of working real hard to get the money for the down payment. Someone had told me of a beautiful home in an exclusive area of Miami. I went to see it, took my mother there, and she said, yes, I want it. It was on the water. We went to the closing. My attorney said, Les, have you had a title search? I said, what's a title search? Well, we just take a couple of days to check it out and make sure there are no liens against the property that you might have to pay if you buy this home. The guy who was there selling me the house, he said, listen, he said, the only reason that I'm selling you this house and selling it at a loss is because I admire the fact that you want to purchase this house for your mother. I have another guy who will give me substantially more money, but I like you. And I've got to get back to Philadelphia. Now, if we cannot consummate this deal now, then the deal is off. I said, there are no liens against the property? He says, no, of course not. I looked at my attorney, I said, I believe him, I'll sign. She said, Mr. Brown, I'm not questioning his honesty. She said, but business is business. I signed that contract and we had a big celebration. Everybody in the neighborhood was talking about Leslie coming home, one of the twins that Mamie adopted to buy her a home. Child, isn't that nice? God is going to bless him. <laughs> a few weeks later, I received a letter, a registered letter, indicating that the house was going up for sheriff sale on the courthouse steps. A man had filed a $12,000 lien against the property because the previous owner owed him that money. And if I did not come up with $12,000 in 30 days, he was going to sell the house to the highest bidder. I called this man and said, Mister, my name is Les Brown. I purchased this house. I had nothing to do with your prior bill. Prior, prior bill, bill. He said, that's not my problem. He said, you should have had a title search. I said, can you give me time? I said, my mother is an older lady. She has a bad heart. And she, I said, please, I said, if you just give me the time, I don't know how I'm going to do it with a house note and everything else, but I think I can pay you at least $2,000 a month. And within six months, somehow I will pay you your money. He said, no, I want it all in 30 days or you get out. I do, did everything I could, racked my mind thinking about how I could get $12,000 because I, I took everything I could to get the money just for the down payment and the closing. I finally had to face the reality that I wasn't going to be able to do it. I was up around two o'clock in the morning, walking back and forth, thinking, how was I going to tell my mother this? My children were there in the room sleeping all night long. I agonized over this. I lost over 23 pounds. Pretty soon I went in the room where my mother was sleeping and I said, Mama, I got down on my knees by the bed. I said, Mama, I got to talk to you. And she said, what's wrong? I said, Mama, I said, we got to get out the house. I said, in my haste to buy the house, I made a mistake. She said, that's all right, baby. I didn't like this house anyhow. <laughs> I 
I said, Mama, you told me you loved it. I brought our friends out here to see it. She said, you know I have arthritis in my knees, and I don't like going up the steps, but I knew it made you happy. You loved it so much. I said, Mom, I've lost 23 pounds agonizing over this. Well, we had to pack up and go back to the old house down the street from Northwestern High School in Liberty City. All those neighbors who came out and saw us leave. <laughs> Those neighbors were there as we were coming back. We went in the house, the roaches were playing cards, saying, come on in and take a hand. I was wiped out. I was embarrassed and humiliated. Words cannot encompass the symbolism of what I felt. I remember when I was unloading the furniture and I, I began to cry. My sister came by. Hmm. You know you didn't have any money to buy no house, Mr. Big Time. <laughs> Hadn't given me a quarter. You know mama got a bad heart now, y'all, back where you belong. <laughs> As I was crying and my head down, taking furniture in, my mama said, hold your head up. I said, mama, I said, I, said, I just feel so bad about this, mama. She said, hold your head up and dry your tears. You have nothing to be ashamed of. And I did as we unloaded that furniture in that house. For several weeks, I was numb. I was immobilized with anger. If I had seen that guy, I was thinking about flying to Philadelphia. I had all kind of dreams about him. And I didn't want to hit this guy here. Hitting would have been too good for him. I just wanted to just grab him and just bite him. Just. <laughs> just made him found him they say well we found this guy just chewing on him <laughs> beating would have been too good for him I'd have just bit him every time he <laughs> I'd have been like a Doberman pincher yeah? <laughs> the God would have said I thought I made everything but I don't know where this came from <laughs> I was reading a book on forgiveness <laughs> And they had a line in there that says, forgive and grow. I had to let that luggage go. You see, your mind is, is, you know, when you go into a service station to get gas, you don't go in there and just start pumping. When you push the lever up, it clears the previous bill. By the same token, if you want to begin to move, you've got to clear your mind of all the unnecessary luggage and baggage that's weighing us down. I couldn't move, I couldn't think about what am I going to do to get out of this situation because I was so concerned about what happened and what he did to me and how bad it was. I was so stuck in that, I couldn't even focus on what I should have done. Feeling sorry for myself and angry, none of that was taking me anywhere. So pretty soon, I, I learned through effort, made a conscious, deliberate, determined effort. I had to let it go, I had to forgive it. Let it go and begin to focus on developing myself. And I say to you, you're going to have people to do things to you. Things are going to happen to you. And the most important thing to do is to harness your will and let it go and move so you can grow, so you can get on with your life. It doesn't matter about what happens to you. What matters is what are you going to do about it? Amen. What are you going to do now, Les? Huh? How long are you going to tell everybody at the bus stop and anybody who would stand and listen to you? <laughs> How long are you going to repeat the same thing over and over and over and over and over again? How many times do we have to hear that? Don't go around telling people we, what your story is. Everybody has a story. 80% don't care and 20% glad it's you. They say, I'm glad that didn't happen to me. <laughs> Sometimes you think you've got some problems. You hear somebody else's problem, and, the, and if that problem is real bad, it makes you feel good. <laughs> Am I right? All right. So I had to let that go. All of us got stories to tell. Chicken Man allowed his tragedy to, to destroy his life. All of us have experienced some tragedy, and if we haven't, we will. And you can either let it destroy your life, or you can build upon it. 
You can permit it to let you let it hold you down, or you can decide I'm not going to let that happen to me. I'm bigger than this. Make a declaration to yourself. Declare all out war that you're going to get out of this rut. I don't care how good you are, I don't care how talented you are, I don't care how much you work on yourself, there are some times when things aren't going to go right. They just are not going to go right. There are times when anything that can happen will happen. Murphy's Law will be knocking at your door. Why? I don't know why. That's called life. And you have to deal with it. Sometimes your life will be in a slump, just like sports. Some of the best shooters can't hit baskets different times in games. They get in a slump. Do they sit on the sideline and say, you know, I just didn't hit a basket today? No, they continue to execute. I suggest to you that if you are facing a challenge, don't stop. Stay busy, work your plan. Continue to do those things that you know that work for you after you have evaluated yourself in the situation. Continue to move, stay busy, stay busy, stay busy. Repeat after me, help somebody. And help yourself. Because what you give is what you get. Find somebody that you can help so you can forget about you for a moment. See, sometimes the best thing to do is to be. Sometimes you have to just back up and go within yourself. A bow and arrow, you, you can't take a bow and just push it out an arrow. You just can't push the arrow out. You have to pull it back and then release it. Sometimes you have to back up and go within and pray and meditate and recharge your batteries. Go away, clear your head, and then come back and look at it from a different vantage point. Don't operate while you're under the spell or the effect of what's going on. Next thing is that you've got to activate the thinker in you. Don't allow your emotions to control you. We are emotional, but you want to begin to discipline your emotion. If you don't discipline and contain your emotions, they will use you. Your mind goes on automatic, just like a god. You know, I loved reading the book called As a Man Thinking by James Allen. He uses the analogy of the mind being like a garden. You know, weeds don't have to have any encouragement to grow. You don't have to water them. They don't have to get sunshine. They don't have to have fertile ground. They will grow through the cracks of a sidewalk. Am I right? But if you want to grow orchids or roses, or any kind of exotic flowers, there are special processes and procedures you must go through. Well, by the same token, you don't have to force yourself or motivate yourself to think negatively, to be depressed, to hate somebody, to want revenge, to want to get back at somebody, to beat yourself up over the head, to feel loaded with guilt. You don't have to make any effort to do that. Your mind is on automatic. It will do that by itself. But if you want to begin to move into your own personal greatness, if you want to begin to really enjoy a happy, successful, healthy life, you've got to be willing to go against the tide. You've got to be willing to harness your will and say, in spite of this, I'm in control here. I'm not going to let this get me down. I'm not going to let this destroy me. I'm coming back and I'll be stronger and better because of it. You have got to make a declaration that this is what you stand for. You're standing up for your dreams. You're standing up for peace of mind. You're standing up for health. You want it, and you're gonna go all out to have it. It's not going to be easy when you want to change. It's not easy. If it were in fact easy, everybody would do it. But if you're serious, you'll go all out. Yes, I'm going to turn this situation around. I'm not going to sit back and, and moan and cry over what happened and what went wrong and who did what. I'm going to do something about this situation. The next thing that is important is that expect things to get better for you because they are. See, life is cyclic. You're not, what is, whatever experience you're having right now, it has not come to stay. It has come to pass. Not to stay, just to pass. It's just going through. The biggest challenge is, is to know what's happening. This is a part of this thing we call life. This too shall pass. And maintaining perspective, putting it in perspective. 
I was doing a training at a college. And it was a two-day training during orientation. And in the training that I provide, I'm a motivational speaker, but I conduct processes in personal dynamics where people begin to go through changes that stimulate the right and left hemisphere of the brain, enable them to see themselves differently. I conducted this particular simulation with these young kids, 17 and 18 years of age, so that they would begin to see how they make decisions or how they would survive in this particular simulation process we gave them. We had them to do it individually and then collectively. Over 30% of them wrote down as their first option in order to survive, they would commit suicide. <laughs> first thing they wrote down. Suicide among young people has increased 300%, over 5,000 will successfully take their lives this year. Why, why did they do that? They I said, I was so shocked, I said, what do you mean? Well, at least we would not suffer. And then they had the nerve to write down all of the other things they were going to do after they committed suicide. <laughs> I said, listen, Kadumbo. <laughs> No, when you, when you come up with a permanent solution for a temporary problem, that's it. Game's over. That's it. You're not going to do anything. Anybody wrote suicide at the top, you can put your pencil down. <laughs> See, a lot of us, because of our limited vision of ourselves, a lot of us who begin to focus on problems and enable them to overwhelm us, we begin to think that we have no options. We begin to believe that there's no way out. Repeat after me, there's always a way. Where there's a will, there's a way. Shake somebody's hand on your right and left and say, I'm unstoppable. You've got to make those kind of declarations to yourself. I'm unstoppable. This will not get me down. And if I get knocked down, I'm going to be like um, Leo Pascal. You said you're going to have some low moments in life, but when you do, you will have high lows <laughs> when you work on yourself. What are some of those things that you can do during this period of time? Go for walks. Do some things for you. Just go for a stroll so you can engage in some reflective thinking on life, on yourself, looking and enjoying the universe, smelling the roses along the way. Listen to upbeat music, music that inspire you. I have only but goodies. I have strategies that I engage in to recharge my batteries. I'm preparing for that because I know things are going to happen that I cannot anticipate. Very good friend of mine died the other day. I had a program for myself. I have books that I read that inspire me, tapes that I listen to that fire me up because you're gonna have sometimes low moments when you won't wanna get out of bed. You just wanna stay there. At times you won't want to come out the house. At times you'll be feeling bad and don't know why, what's wrong, I don't know. <laughs> Just leave me alone. <laughs> why did that happen? I don't know. It's called life. <laughs> the other thing is take full responsibility for your life. Accept where you are and the responsibility that you're going to take yourself where you want to go. Someone said we have two primary choices in life. We can either accept conditions as they exist or we can take the responsibility to change them. See, a lot of people want to exempt themselves from taking responsibility. All they want to do is talk about the problem. Every time you see them, they'll tell you their story over and over and over and over again. No, no. You want to take responsibility for your life. I got me here, I can get me out of this. And I'm getting out. I'm not going to be a volunteer victim. George Bernard Shaw said there are two kinds of people in life. You know, he said those that make things happen, those that watch things happen, and those that don't know what happened. <laughs> And he said, the people that get along in this life look around for the circumstances that they want, and if they can't find them, they make them. They create them. So part of beginning to get unstuck, you've got to decide that the behavior pattern that you have adopted doesn't work for you. You've got to change your strategies, and changing your strategy means reinventing your life. Recreating you, and you have the power to do that. You can decide that you're going to change, that you're not going to be a wimp. You can decide 
that you're going to stand up to life. You can decide that I'm going to live each day as if it were my last. You can, you have the power to make that decision. You can decide I'm going to work on myself and develop myself. I'm going to empower me. And all of these things that are happening to me right now, they're just temporary inconveniences. They're not stronger than I am. I'm in charge here. Next thing is separate what you do from who you are. That's what the guilt trap is about. See, a lot of folk won't let you forget what you used to do or what you have done, what mistakes you've made. All of us have made some mistakes in life. All of us have done some things that if we had them to do over again, we wouldn't do it again. There are a lot of things that if I had it to do over again, if I knew then what I know now, I would have done it differently. Well, it didn't happen that way. And that's what you call life. I didn't do it like that. Oh, you don't want me to live that down. How you want to keep on putting that in my face about what I did. Guess what? I'm not interested. That's what I did then. Won't do it today, so you are picking on an innocent man. Hello. <laughs> so as you're in the process of reinventing your life, write a description of the kind of person that you want to be. What are the things that you must overcome? What qualities about your personality you know that you're going to have to change because those particular characteristics are liabilities to you? <coughs> What are your assets? What are your strong points? Look at and evaluating yourself to make that determination. Other thing is that in order to get out of a rut, we need some coaching. Find some trusted critics. People that you know care about you and love you. So there's some things that keeps us from growing and getting out of ruts. Number one, we identify with feedback. We take it personal when someone wants to give us some feedback on where we are falling short and tell us about our blind spots. We want to have everything being positive about us. We're not perfect. It's, it hurts. I, I have a friend who's a trusted critic. I don't like him, but I love him. He doesn't tell me the things I want to hear. He tell me what I need to hear so I can grow. It hurts. It hurts when he put me on the hot seat. I can't stand it. <laughs> but that's the only way that I can grow. And I'm glad that he loves me enough to risk our friendship to tell me what I need to hear, not what I want to hear. Get a support group, somebody that you can talk to, people who perhaps might have a similar problem. Support groups are very powerful, that you can share some of the challenges that you're going through. And it might be a situation where one person can give you an idea of how they handle that situation and create an opening for you. Begin to stimulate some possibilities in your mind on how you can resolve the problem. We can't grow by ourselves. As I mentioned before, we grow from people and projects. The other thing is about life, when things happen to you, when you permit things to use you, you can't change the past, but you can interpret. You can reinterpret how you see it. For years, I was going around with a heavy load on my shoulders, feeling bad because I was adopted, doing interviews for adoption agencies and foster homes. And I was on television once, and I, I t told these people in this particular interview that I was given away, my twin brother and I, when we were six weeks of age. A friend of mine, fortunately, was listening to the program. And she said, Les, I'd like to have lunch with you. And so I went over to see her. She said, when a woman carries a baby for nine months, feeling that life movement in her, it's automatic and natural for her to learn to love that baby, to expect it to come here when she bears the pain to bring it into the world. Your mother, Mamie Brown, when she came in to adopt you guys, she didn't go through that process. She looked at whoever your biological mother was and said, I'll take him. You weren't given away less. You were chosen with love. <laughs> same circumstances, same event, 
but reinterpreted, an interpretation that empowers me. Am I making sense to you? Yes. So when you begin to look at your past, give an interpretation that empowers you. That's where I used to be. That's not where I am now. I'm growing. Now I want you to think about in your mind right now, think about some particular event or act in your life that you feel very bad about, that you really regret that that took place. If you had to do over again, you would do it differently. With that there, I want you to see yourself in your mind's eye and say to yourself, I love myself unconditionally. And I forgive myself. If I knew better, I would have done better. I want you to think about somebody that, that caused you some pain, caused you some disappointment, somebody that you don't like. Let me tell you something about the mind, how it uses you. Tell you something super stupid that I used to do. Do you know for years, I hated my mother and my father, whoever they were, because they gave me away as I thought at that point in time? And guess what? I didn't have any faces for the hatred because I never saw either one of them. And I said, I hate them for that. And then once I forgave them and said, it's okay. Had they not given me away, I would have never been blessed to have the mother that I have, who to me is the greatest mother in the world. So the universe unfolds as it should. But when I went through this process, saying forgive them, I remember in my mind as I was trying to picture these people, I had two individuals in my mind standing there with no faces because I didn't know how they look. But I release that. I let that luggage go. Think about somebody that you've hurt, somebody that you've disappointed, either deliberately or inadvertently. Or someone that has hurt you, deliberately or inadvertently. Think about them, somebody that, that you really, really, when you think about them, the, the room turns red. <laughs> Look at them in your mind's eye and say, I forgive you. I forgive you unconditionally. Whew, boy, that's a heavy load to let off. When I thought about that guy, I said, wait a minute, I can't not, no, you don't know what this guy did. This was my mama. You, you don't know what we went through. My student said, Les, forgive, let it go. If you want to be forgiven, you better forgive somebody. <laughs> None of us are perfect. All of us have made some mistakes. And it wasn't easy. It's not easy forgiving. Am I right? It's hard. See, everybody won't forgive. They say, I forgive, but I don't forget now. <laughs> <laughs> Let it go so you can grow. Let's get a little demonstration here. Throw it up on this side here, right? Demonstrate it like this. Let's go. I throw away negative thoughts. Revenge. Guilt. Anything that's been holding me back. Now with that right hand, let's bring something in. I bring in love. Peace of mind. Good relationships. Whole lot of money. People raise their voices when we say a whole lot of that. <laughs> I mean, they get serious too, you know what I mean? And usually people don't use one hand, they use two hands. <laughs> they try to borrow somebody else's hand, you know? <laughs> Reinterpreting our past, understanding and knowing that we can move from where we are. 
that we can begin to design the kind of life that empowers us, that gives us happiness, that enable us to be on top of who we are, knowing that as we begin to explore new horizons and new vistas in life, that as we begin to, to focus on developing ourselves, as we begin to elevate ourselves and not to follow the crowd, activating the thinker in us and dis disciplining and putting on hold the emotional part of ourselves. It's not easy, but through practice and practice and practice, practice makes what? Practice. Absolutely not. Dismantle that belief system. <laughs> practice makes improvement. You can always better your best. You can always go beyond anything that you have ever done. You never hit a state of perfection. You're always bigger than what you do. And so all you're looking for are new breakthroughs through practice and practice and practice. You'll get better and better and better. And there's still some things that will happen to you that will catch you on the blind side that you did not anticipate. You'll get knocked down, but you won't be knocked out. You'll be able to get to your feet again, be on the ropes, but you have a fast recovery rate when you work on yourself.